Okay, so we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get started. Um, the first thing that I'm gonna do, uh, as promised, I'm gonna walk you all through your first comment. I saw a lot of you already kind of doing it, which is totally fine. But I figure I'll make sure I show you all how to do it. If you've been in one of my other classes before, obviously you're very well versed with comments by now. Um, so this is a little bit uh, redundant for you. But for the rest of you, I wanted to make sure that I went through it. I uh, I went ahead and logged into my student account, not my administrator account, so it should look very similar to what you guys see. Um, and I'm doing it on my laptop instead of the school computer, um, so it's slightly different, but it, it shouldn't really matter that much. Um, so when I go to, to make my comment, I'm going to go to the student work section, and I'm going to come down to Archie 135. I'll go to exercises, and then over to exercise 101. This will show all the work that people did uh, and posted from last class. So this is the exercise 101, this is what you did. And if I were writing comments, I would look through and say, what looks interesting you know, to me? Maybe it's, maybe it's something like this. Okay? I, yeah, that's kind of interesting. And I'd spend a little bit of time, and I'd look at it, and I'd read it. And because I'm logged in here, if I scroll to the bottom in the comment section, I can go ahead and submit a comment. Notice that it's telling me that I'm commenting using my digital tools for Architects account. That's important. I have to be logged in for this comment to count. So I want to make sure that you, you guys are logged in first and then you make your comments. That's how I can track you. So you want to make sure that you're logged in. The first time that you post a comment, because of spam reasons, it will go into a queue that I have to manually approve. Once you're approved for a comment, it'll show up instantly. So you'll write your comment and it'll just appear. For if you haven't written a comment yet and I haven't approved it yet, when you do this first one, it won't show up right away. Don't panic. It will be there. I just have to go through and get through all 30 of you to make sure. Uh, and that's a spam thing. A couple other things about commenting. There's a 25 character minimum. So you can't just say sweet or nice or good job. Right? I cut all of that out. So you can't do that. So this is supposed to be constructive. Remember, I'm asking you to do three comments in five minutes. So if you do the math, you have more than a minute to write your comment. You can write a lot more than 25 characters in one minute. Make sense? So think about it. And so when you make your comment, you want to make sure that it's something constructive about what the person wrote or about the project uh, or something. You know, I might write here something like uh, the outdoor space in this building is uh, unique because is both outside and inside at the same time. For example, right? I would like to, to incorporate this type of design blending in one of my future designs, right? So that I'm trying to write something meaningful. Not, I really like the building, it's cool. Okay, So I've written something meaningful. I come down here and I go ahead and click on post comment. There are two check boxes. So if you really want to like be part of a thread where you're hearing what other people comment on or whatever, you can check those boxes. They're opt in, not opt out. So that's good. So if you don't want to hear anybody's comments further, don't check the boxes. And then go ahead and click on post comment. For me, I've commented before. So it will show up right away and be there. After I approve you, yours will show up right away and be there as well. So it shouldn't be too, too difficult to get kind of in, the, in the, the practice of that. But I wanted to walk through that with you first today so that you would be comfortable with it. I'm asking for this first one that you write just one comment. You don't have to write three, just one comment. So pick one person's exercise and write one comment for it today. So we're going to move now into today's official lecture. So bear with me while I switch over here into slideshow format. And this is a bit different than our traditional lectures where I'm going to be talking uh, at length about specific software and strategies for software and how we're going to design certain, certain things or graphic design, etc. This is my catch-all lecture for the stuff that I think you as a student, especially as a design student, really need to know or be aware of. And so I kind of throw it all together in one 
thing. We do it in the beginning of class. I used to do it at the end of class uh, kind of as a summary lecture, but I found it's more useful in the beginning if we talk about file structures earlier because then you can implement those rather than waiting until the end. So it's kind of my catch-all. It's a great second day of class. It gets you used to me talking, gets you used to how things are going. We don't have anything too official coming up you know, today in your exercise. We'll work through your calendars and that sort of thing in, in your exercise. So I'm going to talk today about technology, design, and architecture in kind of a big overview, broad stroke manner. And we'll talk some specific stuff. I think the first thing to kind of get your handle on is how do you organize your digital life? Obviously, you guys have some form of organization when you have your laundry in your dresser drawers, right? Your underwear goes in the top drawer, and your pants go further down, and your t-shirts go somewhere. There's an organization. Some of you might be really, really well organized, like Marie Kondo organized. Some of you might be more like me and kind of stuff it where it fits in the drawer, OK? The point is that there is some kind of an organization to your life, whether you want it or don't really want it. Your digital life is very similar in this, in that you have to figure out where you're going to store all your digital files on your computer. And there's a couple different strategies for how this works. One strategy is to have a flat file system. And a flat file system is a very big stroke. I have a documents folder. Maybe that's it. Maybe all my files are just in the documents folder. Well, I know if I created it, it went in the documents folder. My dad's notorious for this on his desktop. Like, I open up his computer, and he, I swear he has like a 1,000 icons on his desktop. It's ridiculous. You might be in this camp. Maybe I can sway you out of that camp today. I'm going to try. So you might organize by file type. So maybe you have your Illustrator files and your Word files and your Photoshop files. Maybe they're all in a folder. That certainly would work, and it's certainly a form of organization of your stuff. It has some advantages, it has some disadvantages. It's organized by similar file types, and the advantage there is if it's a paper and I wrote it in Word, it's going to be in that folder somewhere. I know it's going to be there. So there's an advantage to that. It's easy to find files of a specific type. Same thing. I, I know I wrote it in Word. I must be in the Word folder. It's difficult, however, to keep projects separate. If everything gets dumped into one big folder, how do you know where your stuff is for English versus your history class versus your architecture class? It kind of all gets jumbled up. Folders are also very large. 100 or more files takes time to look through and try to remember what you named that file from two semesters ago when you're looking for it. The alternative to this would be to set up some kind of a hierarchy system. And obviously, I believe in this a little bit more than the flat file system. I think it'll save you uh, a little bit of time long term in how you find your files and search for your files. But the way that this works is essentially you have your documents folder. Inside of that documents folder, maybe you have some subfolders, like school. It's a good folder. Maybe work, maybe personal. Inside of the school folder, you might have folders for your individual classes. Inside your classes folder, you might have individual folders for your exercises and your assignments, or for your different papers, or whatever it is. So this is starting to organize it in a slightly different manner. So this also has advantages and disadvantages. It's organized by projects. So I'm working on this particular project. I'm working on this particular English paper. I'm working on this particular history paper. All the stuff relating to that is going into that folder. You do research for your history paper. You collect images for your architectural history paper. You put them all in that folder. Therefore, I know that it's all there. And I can always go find it. That makes it pretty easy to find your files. All you have to do is know where that file is. So here, you can use me as an example. I was in grad school in 2005 to 2007. That was a long time ago, right? Because I'm old and my hair's falling out. It is. It's true can't help it. If I needed to go back and I needed to revisit or I wanted to look at a project that I did in grad school in one of my studio classes, I could go right there and find those files because I know what project it was. That's pretty easy to remember the project. Could I tell you what the files were named right now? No way. I have no idea what they're, actually I probably could tell you what they were named, but in all reality I probably couldn't or I shouldn't be able to remember that. So because it's a project, it's in a folder, it's pretty easy to find all the stuff related to that, which is a really good thing. The other great thing about this system is if you really want to find all your Word documents, you can still do a search 
for your Word documents. And just type .doc and look for all your Word documents and get it that way. So you get the best of both worlds. It takes a little bit of foresight because you have to start putting things in their right places. Instead of just default save to documents folder, default save to desktop, you have to think, OK, well, wait, where does this go? I promise you, you can do it. It won't take too long to get in the habit of doing that. So for you guys here at school, what do I recommend? How do I recommend storing your files? And trust me, there will, throughout the semester, I'm going to come and sit down at your computer, and you're going to have stuff on your flash drive, and most of you have it disorganized. I've been around long enough to know this. That's why I'm telling you this right now, because it will help you later on. I promise you that. So if I was projecting what I would do on my flash drive or my hard drive at school here, I would have the root of my flash drive. That's just the drive itself. And inside of that, I would have a folder for my OneDrive or my Dropbox, because we're going to talk about backup in a little bit. And that would be all the stuff that's backed up. That's all the unreplaceable, irreplaceable stuff. The stuff that I create would go in there. So inside of that OneDrive folder, I'd probably have folders for my classes. 135, 131, 121. I don't know what classes you're in. So I'd have those. And then inside of those folders, for 135, for example, I'd have a folder for my exercises, and I'd have a folder for my assignments. So I'm already trying to establish that organization. Outside of the OneDrive, the backed up folder, I'd have a folder for resources. These are things that I use, but I could go get again. In this class, it's not quite so relevant. In my 136 class, it's very relevant because, for example, you have a big V-Ray material library. Well, you know where to get that material library. You can download it again. So if you lose it, not the end of the world. So it can go outside. You don't really have to back it up. It saves a little bit of space. If you have a really big Dropbox or you have a really big OneDrive, sure, throw that in there as well. No harm in doing it. Just takes a little bit of extra space. So this is how I would suggest that you organize your flash drive. And I think it will help you a lot as you go through the semester to be a little bit more organized. That stress that creeps in at the end of the semester, when you're disorganized and you can't find your stuff, it makes that stress that much worse. So if you start it now, you're in better shape at the end. Then we get into naming your files. Okay, if I were to look at your computer at home, there's a pretty good chance that you have a bunch of Untitled 1, Untitled 2, Untitled 3, Untitled 4. Yeah? Anybody fall in that camp? Yeah, a few of you. Most of you just don't want to admit it. Okay? Thinking about how you name your files is also important. And it can be something that can help you long term. I mentioned a little bit ago that I probably could guess at what I named the files when I was back in grad school. That's because I followed this. The idea here is that you're trying to make some identifiers that means everything in this particular class belongs with this little prefix. So the way I did it in grad school doesn't mean you have to do it this way. Remember, this is a conceptual idea. So just because I do it precisely like this, if you think doing it a slightly different way is, is better, do it that way. It's OK. I'm not telling you you have to do it this way. I'm suggesting that you do it. So in this case, I put a prefix in front of every file that's associated with a particular class. And the way that I designated what that prefix was is I said the subject, which was architecture, that got A. Then I put the class number, so in this case it would be 135. And then I put the first letter of the last name of the person who taught it. Now you guys are sitting there and saying, well, wait a minute, why? Why is that relevant? Couldn't I just stop at A135 for this class? Yeah, you could. In grad school, you take the same class multiple times. So you take a 201 advanced studio in architecture three times while you're in grad school. So I had three folders with 201. It would be A201, and then how do I say which one it is? So in that case, I added the extra letter. You don't have to, just an idea. So it's a way of identifying all the stuff that's relating to that class has that prefix. So if I had to go back and remember that grad studio that I was talking about, all the files that I worked with that were relative to that 201 studio would have a 201U in front of them. And I could go back on my hard drive and in my backup files and find all those files because of that. So it can really help you to think about that. Then I want to talk about the end of the file. So the opposite end. We talked about the prefix. Now let's talk about the suffix. And you guys probably already do this anyway. Anybody number their files? I mean, when you do a save as, it's like version 2, version 3, right? 
It's a great thing to do in design. We, in the, in the world of design, do iterative processes. We start with one design, we evolve it, we make it a little bit different, we stop, we look at it, we reflect on it, we go back, we do it again. We evolve it again. And sometimes we evolve it and we go, ooh, that didn't turn out very good. And we want to go back. That's why these kinds of number schemes are good. Because you can go back a version. You can say, yeah, that didn't turn out so well. So I would take this a little bit further. Two things. I would do a version and an addition. So the addition is the number. That's big change stuff. Big revision. That would be numbered. Version, I just add a letter after it. And that's like small change. I do a rendering. I tweak the light settings a little bit. I save it as version B. I do a little bit more tweaking. I change the material a little bit, change the scale, texture mapping a little bit. It's C. It's D. So little changes are the version. Big changes are the addition. Just a little bit finer control. If you want to stick with numbering, that's cool too. It's a way of keeping track of that iterative process that design is inherently uh, doing. So if I put it together, you'd have the prefix in the front. Come on. There you go. You'd have that prefix in the front. The stuff that goes in the middle, whatever you want to call your file, I could care less. You can put whatever you want there. And then at the end, there's right there my addition and my version. And so I'd have those two things at the end to designate that iterative process. A couple other things. If you're going to be uploading your files online, it's good practice not to put any spaces in your files. On a computer, if you're saving it on your hard drive, it doesn't matter whether you're a Mac person or a Windows person, you can put spaces in the file names. It makes no difference. Your computers can recognize it fine. Have you ever tried typing in a web browser? If you put a space in, what happens? It Google searches for something, right? Because it's taking that text string and then doing a Google search. So the web doesn't like spaces. So if you have a file that has spaces in it and you upload it to the web, it's going to put some special characters in there to hold the spaces for you. And it's going to make it look funny. And you guys have done this. You've gone to like your bank and downloaded your bank statement and it's got a bunch of percent signs and whatever in it. It's because they put some spaces in and they needed some placeholders. So if you cut those spaces out, that's a good thing if you're planning on uploading the file. Do I do it all the time to my files? No because most of the files I don't upload. But I do think ahead. Sometimes I do upload things, in which case I don't put spaces in. All of the lecture slides that I post online, I never put spaces in. Instead, I put an underscore or a dash where the space would go. It just makes it a little bit cleaner. The other thing to stay away from are any slashes, question marks, or periods, because those are coding terms. Your computer's looking for those and doing something with that. And it can get confused. Most of the time, it can figure it out. You might have discovered this before by putting a period in a file name and at the end and having the computer not associate it correctly with the file that it needs to open. You go to try to open it and it won't open because it's looking for a different extension. That's where that period comes in. So your computer is looking for a dot something, a dot docx for a word file, a dot indd for an InDesign file, a dot psd for a Photoshop file. It's looking for that dot so it knows, hey, this is what I opened this file in. And if you confuse it, it doesn't know what to open it in. Backup. So this is something that is extremely, extremely important. How many people back up their files on a regular basis? Yeah, a couple of you. OK, so my goal today is to convince you that you need to change, like you really do. I promise you. So backing up. OK, backing up is absolutely critical. I'm going to tell you some stories about why backing up is so critical. But we'll talk about backup first, and then we'll get to the critical stories. So this is a, um, a strategy that was evolved from the Pixel Core, which is a multimedia guild of artists based in San Francisco. This is how they store and back up their files. I think it's a really good way of thinking about backup. It's called the 321 principle. So we start with three. You should always have three copies of your files. Say, ooh, that's a lot of copies. Okay, But we need three copies of your file. You have your primary working copy, the one that you're opening and working with, and you have two backups somewhere. Three copies. Two different mediums. 
So in this case, we want to have it stored in two different places. So if you have a hard drive on your computer and you have a flash drive, that's two different mediums. Now computers tend to come with solid state drives, so it's kind of like a flash drive and a flash drive. Yeah, I'll still count it as two different mediums. You could burn it on a disk. That's a little inconvenient, but it certainly would work. You could store it in the cloud. That's a different location. Any media can fail. Anybody had a hard drive fail before? Yeah, a couple of you. OK, so I'm going to tell you a story about hard drive fail. Um, this can happen to anybody. It happened to me. So this was probably hmm, three years ago or so. It was the fall semester. I got to the, the, the last day of class. You guys all had your donuts. You turned in your portfolios. Life was good. Class was over. Took my laptop, walked across the hallway there, sat down in my office, started to enter grades, got about halfway through the grades. Boom, hard drive gone, right there. Non-recoverable, dead, like dead, dead. Not like you can pull it out, put it in an external drive, and get it reconstituted. Like, might as well have drilled a hole through it, dead. What if that happened to you? What if that happened right before your presentation in a class? What would you do? <laughs> Let's hope not. Did I panic when that happened? What do you think? No, I didn't panic because I back up my files all the time. Did I lose anything on my computer? Absolutely not. OK, let me tell you another story. These, these are great. Stories are fun, right? Chances are you can tell me these same stories. That happened to you. So this is a different semester. I was with my kids. We were, we, we, this, was, this was in the fall again. We were, we were doing something special. We went up to cut down a Christmas tree. Okay? This was a great day. We were having fun. I had my laptop in my truck with me. We were, we were out. I didn't want to deal with my dogs, so I left my dogs in the truck. Okay? No big deal. They could survive. The windows were down. All was good. I left my dogs in the truck, left my laptop in the front of the truck sitting there. OK, all is good. My kids were like, oh, dad, this is great. We're having such a good time. Can we have hot chocolate? I said, absolutely, let's have cho hot chocolate. This is so fun. Why not? We have hot chocolate. Great. Did my kids drink all the hot chocolate? No. If you have kids, you realize this. You buy them something, they drink like a third of it. OK? So I, being, being me, I'm like, oh, I'll drink it on the way home. No problem. I put it in my cup holder in my truck. Didn't think about it. Something happened, and we had to go back and get you know the, I don't know, we got out of the truck. The dogs were still in the truck. I left. I came back, guess what? My dogs climbed from the back into the front, knocked the entire cup of hot chocolate into my laptop bag. My laptop was not facing the front side up, it was facing back up, so the vents were pointing directly at the hot chocolate. The laptop was full of hot chocolate. <laughs> Completely full of hot chocolate. Was the laptop dead? Yep. Was it recoverable? Could I have gotten things off of the hard drive? Nope. Did I panic? Nope, because I had my stuff backed up. So the point is, I tell you these silly stories because they did happen. I promise you I didn't make them up. But I tell you these stories because it will happen to you. I had a student come in to me. This was a long time ago. This was probably in 2008 or 2009. Uh, I gave this kind of a lecture talking about backup. It's evolved a little bit. I had a student come in to me. Uh, I gave the lecture in the beginning of the semester. I had a student come in to me at the end of the lecture, or at the end of the semester, and I could tell something was wrong. I'm like, hey, are, are you OK? She's like, can I just give you a hug? I'm like, OK, like, I guess. And she's like, thank you. I can't thank you enough. I just walked out to my car. Somebody smashed in my window and grabbed my laptop off the front seat. I have my finals tomorrow, and because of you, I backed up all my stuff and I didn't lose anything. So I'm not going to fail. Okay? It happens. It will happen to you. If it hasn't already, it will happen. Somebody will do something this semester and will lose their files. I had a student sit down at one of these computers. It was right over there. I think it was in your seat. I had a student sit down in their computer, turn around to talk to their friend, and snap their flash drive in half. That was a week before the finals. For 221, it was their skyscraper. It happens. 
Sorry, I'm obviously talking too long because it's, it's back to my desktop. Um, anyway, so I don't mean to drone on and on, but I hope that by talking about this, where you go? I hope that by talking about this, I've convinced you that it will happen because it will. So you want to think about it. So two different mediums because any media can fail. One, so we did three copies of your files, two different mediums. One should be off-site in a cloud somewhere that's not with you. So if you lose your laptop, somebody steals your laptop, it's not with you. If your house burns down, which I hope it doesn't, it's not with you. So another story, because stories are fun, and this is about my wife. So my wife grew up in the Central Valley, and when she was in high school, she was, she was abroad with her mom, and she got a call from her stepdad, and her stepdad said, the levee's going to break, and it's either going to break on our side or it's going to break into Marysville. What do you want from your room? You have an hour. What if I presented that to you? What would you grab? You know, obviously you'd grab like your kids. That would be a good thing, right? But what else would you get? You'd probably get your photo albums maybe. Maybe you'd, uh, I don't know, think about it. It's not a bad thing to mentally go through. I'm not saying that your house is gonna flood or burn down or whatever. Turned out that the levee didn't break and everything was fine, okay? But if you have to go through that mental exercise, it's a good, uh, a good thing to think about. Right? I grab my laptop and I grab my external hard drive bay and walk out the door. The rest of it can go. Because I know what I need. So think about the same thing. One off-site. So you're in the lab. You say, well, wait a minute. How on earth can I follow this 3-2-1 principle because I'm in the lab and the computers are locked and if they restart on me, it all goes away. Guess what? You can still do it. One copy is going to be on your flash drive or your hard drive. Which is good. I love the image, right? This four gig drive. Yeah, like anybody has that anymore. Okay. We're gonna. I'm gonna teach you today how to sync up with uh, OneDrive because it works and plays really nice with the computers. I used to use Dropbox a lot more, uh, but the OneDrive plays nice with Windows 10. So we're gonna do OneDrive. Uh, you guys all, by the way, get a 25 gig account for free with your Insight ID. So that should get you through most of what you need for the semester, which is not bad. Um, we're going to teach you to back up your flash drive or your hard drive with OneDrive. So it's going to upload the contents of that folder. That's good. And because of that, you can install OneDrive on your computer at home, and it will take a third copy and copy it to your computer at home. So you'll have three copies, one on your hard drive, one in the cloud, one at home. That's three copies. Two different mediums, one's on your flash drive, one's on your hard drive at home. One copy is in the cloud, so it's off-site. It's stored at Microsoft servers somewhere. So we just did 321. And with that 321, if we're following it, if something were to happen to your flash drive, you were to snap it off, no worries. Just go get another flash drive. You still have all your stuff. That's what this system is so good for. It protects you for all the things that happens. You're not going to lose your stuff. And that's really, really important. Backups have to occur automatically and in the background. If you manually say, you know what, every day when I get home from school, I'm going to copy all of my work onto my home computer. Somebody's going to, you know, you're going to say, yeah, okay, that works, and it'll work for a week. And then some, one of your friends is going to say, hey, you want to go out and get some food after school? And you're going to be like, yeah, that'll, that sounds great. I'm tired. You know, let's go, let's go get some food. Then you go have some food. Maybe you indulge a little bit more. Some of you are too young for that. So, of course, you wouldn't do that. But the, the other people that are older, they would do that. Almost sure. Um, and then, you know, they say, well, let's go bowling. I don't know. Does anybody bowl anymore? I don't know. I think it sounds fun. I have kids. I don't get to do that stuff anymore. So, yeah, maybe we'll go bowling. And, and then all of a sudden you get home, and it's a little late, and you got early class tomorrow, and you just fall asleep. Did you back up your stuff? Nope. Because it required that effort. So we have to get you out of the loop. So it has to happen automatically. What are your options? There's some stuff that's built into your computers. If you have a Mac, uh, you have Time Machine, you have iCloud backups of your document folder, same thing. Same thing with Windows. You have built-in backups. That's good. There are aftermarket solutions that some people like. Um, these are a variety of them. They, they vary in what they do. Sometimes you back up files. Sometimes you can create an exact copy of your hard drive if you wanted to upgrade your hard drive, for example. Uh, some of the other backup solutions, you pay a service and they just constantly back up your files for you. We are going to discuss OneDrive 
in this class, and you'll, you'll use OneDrive, Dropbox is kind of the same thing. They're very prolific at this point. It used to be very specific. There were only a few companies that did it. Now kind of everybody's in this space uh, creating backups. The point is, though, that you need to actually set them up and start them doing it. So here's a variety of the online backup solutions, uh, Dropbox and OneDrive. Uh, you guys will get, with your DVC email, you get 25 gigs for free. Um, Google Drive gives you 15 gigs for free. Uh, a lot of people really like it. A lot of people already use it. I've had plenty of students try to use it in the lab, and it just doesn't play well with these computers. Um, it's, it's difficult. Um, you can do it. You just have to download all your files and then copy them back up. It just doesn't play nice. Um, so Dropbox, there's a portable version of Dropbox, I believe, that still works, that you can run off your flash drive. Uh, but the OneDrive actually seems to work the best, uh, and that's why I push it. Not that I'm a, the kind of person who tends to push Microsoft products, as I, as I have all my non-Microsoft products up here. Um, but just be aware that it seems to work really nice. Okay? Uh, and there's a few other ones. If you're really worried about security and stuff, you can actually run your own cloud separate and apart on your own server. You have to pay for it and set it up, and it's a little bit of a hassle. This is what I do for myself and my own personal stuff. Because I have servers and because I'm interested in that sort of thing, I have my own. It's private. It's encrypted. Nobody has access to my files. I don't have to worry about Google or Microsoft or anybody else seeing anything. So that's just me. But it's something that I at least like to point out that it exists. So backup nightly. Actually, this really should be like backup minutely or secondly, right? All the time, backup. Um, and then we can continue with these slides, and you guys get where I'm going, is you should basically always be backing up. This one's a good one. Uh, and I encourage people to do this at the end of a semester. Uh, I used to say, get a DVD and burn all this stuff on a DVD. Well, now nobody even has DVD drives on their computers anymore, so that's kind of a moot point. But take a flash drive. Take your flash drive for the semester. Remember, flash drives are cheap now. Copy all your stuff from your classes from that semester, put them on a flash drive, and put them in a drawer somewhere. The nice thing here is you go to do your portfolio in two years, and you want to go back and remember that Mondrian Museum that you did in 121. You can go back to that flash drive and have all that stuff. So it's really nice to have those semester backups, because you can go back and find them real quick. Uh, yearly, same thing. So then you get to this off-site peace of mind thing. Okay? So some of you have things that are really, really important to you. I'm sure you do. I have some things that are very important to me. Some of those are the birth photos of my children when they were born. That's really important to me. Do I have online backups of all those? Yes, I do. Maybe my wedding photos, right? It's funny, you have the birth of your kids and that somehow you don't think anything can be as cool as your wedding and then you have kids and your kids are awesome, right? So what those things that are just absolutely cherished things that I would be devastated if I lost, what do I do? Well, I put those on a hard drive and I stick them in my safety deposit box. You know, the, ho the poor bank robbers are going to be so disappointed when they open my safety deposit box. They'll open it up, gold bars, mm, hard drive, sweet. The point is that that's something that I find really important. Is this a complete hassle? Is it up to date? Does it happen all the time? No. Is it out of date? Yeah. Are my four month old daughter's pictures in there? Nope. Because I have to do it. That's a problem. That's not automated. But it's a nice, safe place that I know I'm never going to lose those. It's off-site. Somebody else keeps track of it. It's not going to burn down. It's safe. Is that extreme? Yeah. Am I a little weird? Yeah, probably. Something to think about, though. If there's something that's that important, how are you protecting it? So shift gears completely. Enough doom and gloom. We're not all going to die. I'll come back to doom and gloom later when I talk about passwords. Calendars. How many people keep a calendar right now? Mm, that's a little scary. I'm glad you guys do. There's all the people that didn't raise your hand. Hopefully you're just shy and, and scared of me at this point. I hope I can break that part too. Calendars are absolutely important for you as a student, for you as a worker, for you in life in general. Calendars are important. Chances are you're going to keep different calendars. You're going to keep a calendar for your work stuff, if you have work. You're going to keep a calendar for school, and you might keep a calendar of personal stuff. When you start to have significant others, partners, kids, suddenly your life gets complicated. There's lots of calendars that intersect each other. And the more you keep track of this, the better organized you are. Subscribe to calendars when possible. If you're really interested in particular sports events or sports teams and you want to know when their games are, 
don't input all their games manually. Go find their calendar subscription and subscribe to it. And then it just shows up in your calendar. That's a good thing. Subscribe to calendars when possible. I have a calendar for all of you for this class that you can subscribe to. That way you're up to date and you know what we're doing on any given day. If something changes, if we have a smoke day, for example, I update the calendar. Calendar changes. You know what's going on. It's automatically on your phone. That's a good thing. Make sure the calendars sync across the devices that you use. So some of the big players, Microsoft, Apple, have their own calendar systems. And those calendar systems play really nice if you live within their ecosystem. So I could use their, the Apple's calendar because I play within their ecosystem. If I was in Microsoft, I could play within the uh, Outlook ecosystem really easily. When you branch across devices, you have an iPhone, but you also have an Android tablet or whatever, it gets a little more tricky. Google is pretty good at talking nice to everybody. So what are our options? We've got lots of free options out there. The web options, the big ones, Google, Yahoo, Outlook. iCloud is Apple's version of it, which as long as you play within Apple is cool. Guess what? It's a calendar. Looks like a calendar, no surprise. Uh, but I throw these up there. This gives you an example. So these are the, uh, the subscription calendars that you'll get. You are all going to, in your exercise, subscribe to the calendar today. I'm going to force you into doing that so you're a little bit more organized. Uh, and it's going to tell you, for example, this is a different day. This was in uh, the fall. I didn't update it for today. But guess what? Here we are, 1.35. It starts at 7.55 AM. It's at Diablo Valley College. It's lecture 102, technology, et cetera. It's cut off, right? Lab exercise 102, establishing your online identity. And it gives us our time frames and everything else. That shows up real nice in your calendar. If we wanted to look at it in a monthly format, we could see it this way. Nothing wrong with that. My wife lives in the monthly format. I like to live in the daily format, but it's different. Uh, if you are in Outlook, this is what it would look like in Outlook. Essentially, you've seen a calendar. You know what it's going to look like. Uh, and Yahoo, if Yahoo's even going to stay in business, is there. Email. OK, so you all have an email account, I'm sure. How many people have at least three email accounts? How many people have more than three email accounts? OK, so you're above the average. The average person has three email accounts. Generally, it's a work email account. It's a friends and family email account. And it's the like spam account that you don't want to give anybody. Or you give everybody because it doesn't matter and you don't check, right? Um, that one also could be the one that you opened when you were 16 and you don't really want to use anymore. That works too. The number of emails sent by humanity each day, this is a little out of date, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 196 billion emails. That's a lot of emails. The average person sends and receives 121 emails a day. How many people are above the 120 emails a day, average? So I'm way above that. I'm at like 500 a day. It's nuts. Okay. That's kind of a problem. It's a lot to get through. So what do we do? How do we declutter that part of our life? Because we're getting all this stuff. Strip your email inboxes down to as few accounts as possible. You don't want to be checking like 800 different accounts. You can do this by forwarding old accounts into new accounts and training people to use your new accounts. Decide which email addresses you want to use and stick with them. So if you opened an email account when you were in high school, and that email account was, you know, superhotdude123 at gmail.com. Maybe when you go to apply for a job, you don't want to use superhotdude123. I'm just saying. So think about it. I had, a, I had a cousin of mine who had an email address that he opened in high school. It was, it was his name, the king, at gmail.com. Then he realized that, you know what? It's probably not the best thing to do when I'm out in the employment world. So he changed it to his name dot his last name at gmail.com. Much more professional. So think about that right now. Take a moment and think about do you really want to be sexy hot dude 123 or do you want to be grant.adams at whatever? A little more professional. You guys are all embarking on that stage in your life. Think about it and consider changing it. Uh, enable your spam filters. That's always a good thing. You don't need email that you don't want to. Um, be careful about unsubscribing 
from emails unless you know, like let's say you're getting emails from Pottery Barn or something, yeah, okay, that's a reputable company, unsubscribe probably would work. If you've never heard of the company and you click unsubscribe, it's kind of like saying, yeah, this is a good email address, keep sending me stuff. Okay, so be aware that the unsubscribe thing doesn't always work. It's better to train your spam filter to just filter that stuff out and get rid of it than to unsubscribe. Uh, there is a great TED Talk. If you guys have time for a little extra homework, there's a great, great TED Talk uh, about a guy who responds to a spammer in email and tries to engage. Anybody seen this one before? It's great. It's super funny. Uh, he talks about engaging with the spammer and trying to get the spammer like to send him money instead of sending the spammer money and stuff. It's really good. So it's, it's like 15 minutes. It's worth your time when you're having lunch or something. Uh, watch it. It's pretty funny. So if you want to forward your email addresses, it's pretty darn simple. In Gmail, you just get into your settings. Um, and when you come over here into the forwarding uh, pop and IMAP settings, it's as simple as checking that little box and then putting in the email address that you want to, uh, obviously it's blocked out in here, uh, that you want to forward to. And then you tell Gmail what to do, put it in the archive or trash it or whatever. That consolidates your email account. So if sexyhotdude123 at gmail.com can be forwarded into grant.adams at gmail.com, for example. I don't have either one of those email addresses, but uh, it, that's a nice thing. Right? You start forwarding those emails, you get it into the one professional email account, you just have the one email account to work through. The forwarding stuff works the same, whether you're in that or you're in Outlook. You guys all have Insight email. You probably all forget to check that Insight email. Guess what? Insight will let you forward that email into your own personal account. I would go in today, this is just my suggestion, and enable that forwarding to make sure that you get all your school emails and don't have to check it separately. The other thing that you can do is you can use an email client that helps you get through your emails faster. There's uh, one that I really like, it's Spark by Riedel. Um, it is a very Apple oriented product, though they do have an Android version of it. Uh, and it's great because it's gesture based. So you can flick one side, flick to the other side to make things spam or delete them. Uh, and you can get through email real quick. And so if you can use a program like that that can help you get through them really quick, that can be useful. Um, so if you're in the Apple world, um, try it out. See if you like it. It's free. Google Voice, another, another, another thing that is worth a little bit of talking about. Uh, it's a product offered for free by Google uh, that allows you to get a phone number that people can text you on and call you on. You can choose what numbers it's forwarded to. And it's a great way of giving people numbers when you don't really want to give them your real phone number. Does this sound familiar? Do you think the number I gave you last class was really my cell phone number? No, it's my Google Voice number. And that's fine. So it comes in. Um, text messages still come in. Everything comes in fine. But it means I don't like permanently give you my real cell phone number. And so that's not a bad thing. And it's something to think about. Um, it's free. It's easy to do. They'll tra transcribe your voicemails if somebody leaves you a voicemail. Uh, they'll, you know, Google will parse it and send you a text message with what it says or an email with what it says. Um, kind of like the way visual voicemail works on your iPhone or whatever. Uh, you can also set up voice greetings for different people that call you. If you want to sound one way to somebody and you want to, you know, when your wife calls, you want to leave her something nicer or whatever, a girlfriend, you know, you can do that. Not that you would have a wife and a girlfriend at the same time, but you get what I'm saying. Architecture and the web. How to develop your online identity. I, by the way, I'm going to go a little bit long today, um, but the lab portion isn't that long. So we're going to spend a little bit more time talking than I normally would. Um, developing an online identity is really important. Uh, and we're going to get to that in just a second. How many people know how the internet works in the first place? It's kind of this thing that's really cool that we all love, but how many people really think about it? Well, the internet works using something called a DNS system, a domain name system where we translate a name that we can remember, like apple.com, to a string of numbers, an IP address. It would be really difficult if we wanted to visit Apple and we had to remember to visit Apple, we had to go to 17.172.224. whatever it is, 47. That could be out of date. They may have changed their uh, IPs from that. That would be difficult. So it's kind of like a phone book. We type in apple.com, the DNS system says, great, the server's the computer that hosts the information that's going to show the Apple website is right here on the internet. That's what it does. So we don't have to remember that string of numbers. 
we can just type in apple.com and it goes where we want. The internet is powered by rooms like this. The photo on the right is a bunch of rack servers. There are rooms and rooms and rooms of these, super cooled. The internet runs on these systems. They're all little computers and they all serve up information. The digital tools site here is actually hosted in LA in one of these rooms on a computer. I have a second server that's hosted in Dallas. That way if the one in LA goes down, it should still be up uh, from the Dallas server. So the point is, those kinds of computers exist in these rooms and that runs the internet. We access the internet through a browser. We have all the standard browsers. You guys are familiar with these. Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge or whatever. Um, I hope you don't use them. Safari, Firefox is still s around somehow. Uh, Chrome, Opera, yeah, I guess. <laughs> That's how we access the internet. We use one of these browsers. It used to matter which browser you picked because some were faster than the others. It doesn't matter anymore. They're all good. Pick the one that you like. That works. Um, unless you want to pick the Microsoft products, in which case you shouldn't pick one of the other ones. But that's beside the point. Um, you want to avoid dangerous scripting languages, though most of this is all um, taken care of because they don't let you do this anymore. Uh, computer manufacturers got smart and realized that people were dumb and uh, would just do anything and let computers install whatever they wanted. So now you at least have to type in your password. So by the way, as like a side note, if your computer asks for your admin password and you're not purposely installing something, it's probably a bad sign. So don't give it to them, <laughs> okay? So think about that before you just randomly type in your password. People are really good at that, you know, where you're just like going along and something pops up. Type in your password. Sure, no problem. Well, wait a minute, think, stop. Do I really want to type this password right now? Um, there's other add-ons. For example, you can block ads, block, block pop-up. <laughs> Sorry. You can block pop-ups. Those kinds of things are useful. Some, some, some people live and make their living based on the ads, so there's some ethical dilemma about should you really block ads on a website because people are making money from the ads and they're posting their content for free and you, get, you can decide. It's there. And then how fast is the browser? It kind of doesn't matter. So Wi-Fi. Are you being safe on Wi-Fi? So we're so used to internet and we're so used to Wi-Fi that we don't even think about this anymore. Okay? The good news is most people, uh, most sites have encrypted their sites by default. So even if you go to Google to search for something, chances are you're going to get their secured encrypted page. You get that little green lock up in the corner. That's a good thing. If that lock is not there and you browse a website, they don't have encryption enabled, and theoretically, anybody who is also on the Wi-Fi network could see what it is that you're browsing. Now, if you go to a bank, of course, they're going to be encrypted, and they're not going to see your bank account information. But it's really important to be aware of the fact that if it's a non-secure website, especially on a big network, i.e. DVC student Wi-Fi, somebody could be malicious and looking at what you're doing. Now, are you really doing anything that interesting? Probably not. Okay. The other thing that's a big one, and I think I'm going to pick on the faculty right now because I'm part of the DVC faculty like network. There are so many faculty people who have shared files, like folders and stuff on their computers, wide open. It's really silly. Right? If you go in on, on a big public network, you go in, uh, let's say, to a, uh, and you're on an airport network, for example. There's a lot of people on the airport network. There's always people that have like their desktop shared. Well, guess what? If you share a folder, somebody can put stuff on your computer. Like, that's not a good thing. So think about whether you're sharing your files or not. If you're on your home network, that's great. Go for it. Yeah. No, it, it's, not, it's not about the connection. It's about you take a folder and you say, I want to share this folder because I want to see it from my other computer. So it's shared file, it's file sharing, essentially. Okay. Um, and so that's the kind of stuff that happens all the time. And I see it on the faculty because people do that, and I don't get it. Anyway, SSL connections, anytime you see that green lock, you're good. So don't worry about it. Look for that green lock. Most websites have that enabled now anyway. Uh, if you have your home network, don't leave it unsecured. Okay? Let's say, for example, that I wanted to do something illegal online. Okay? Let's say I wanted to pirate a movie or something like that, and I lived in an apartment complex. Do you think I'd do it on my own network, or do you think I would do it on my neighbor's unsecured network? 
I would do it on my neighbor's unsecured network, right? So you, being the neighbor, should secure your network, right? So I'm telling you this so that you have general awareness of this kind of thing, OK? Uh, the WPA uh, 128 or 256 bit encryption is great. Um, the WEP doesn't even matter because most of the routers are absolute. They don't do that anymore. Um, so take your router, make sure there's a password on it, make sure it's encrypted, makes life a whole lot better. So virtual private network. This is another thing that I like to bring up uh, because it solves some serious problems, uh, especially with the changes in laws about net neutrality. Um, this is something you guys should be aware of going forward. Uh, and I'll show you a few specific examples. So what a virtual private network does is it essentially allows you to connect to a computer encrypted to a, another computer and then browse the internet or do what it is that you want to do online from that computer in that location. So an example, my father-in-law spends six months of the year in Ecuador. He has an SBC or an AT&T email account. When he's in Ecuador, he can't access his AT&T email account because it's blocked for some reason. So he needs to use a technology like this to pretend virtually that he's in California so he can access his email. So I'm going to show you this live in just a second so you can see how it works. But it allows us to shift geographic locations. And depending on which version of this you, you work with, it can mask your identity as a whole. So you could browse the internet, quote, anonymously. Now, of course, if you go to a site and log in, they're going to know who you are. Okay? But it is something that's, that's available. There's a variety of companies that offer this. But I like to bring this up because it solves some serious problems. Uh, there was a while where people wanted to be able to watch some of the BBC programming, and you could only do that in England. If you really wanted to be able to log in and watch it, you needed to have a computer in England. Well, you can do this through virtual private network. You could become a computer in England. So it's something that really can solve a lot of the challenges. Essentially, this is what it does. This is the way it is. In a normal connection, if I went home and I started browsing my computer, Comcast, my internet service provider, could see whatever it is I was browsing, what sites I went to, because they control my internet. If I didn't want them to see it or to watch over my shoulder, I would connect to one of these virtual private networks. It would encrypt my connection to there, and then I would access the internet from there out. Many companies do this, where you actually tunnel into the company and then access the company resources from outside of the company. Um, so it's, it's not that uncommon. Anyway, before we go into passwords, I'm going to show you this live, just so you can kind of see this in relative terms. So bear with me for a second. Uh, so I'm going to pull up right here a, let's see if this will load for me. I have, this should come up. OK, so this is, a, a, this is just a website. You guys can go to it, too, as well. Um, it's, I, I said, what is my IP address? Uh, and so it's telling me that this is my IP address, 192.235.1.50. That's how I'm accessing the internet. And I am in Pleasant Hill, California. It gives me my latitude and longitude. It tells me that, yes, I'm running uh, OS 10 on my Apple computer. Um, and it tells me other information, like what my screen size is, et cetera. This is all readily available information because I'm browsing the internet. Okay? If, however, I wanted to be in New Zealand, I can connect to, I thought I had New Zealand on here. Well, let's go to Australia instead. I can connect to Australia and pretend I'm, I'm creating an encrypted connection from here to Australia. And then I'm accessing the, the internet as if I were in Australia right now. So I would come back to the same page, and I'll refresh my page. And there I am. So my new IP address is 135.59.252.216. Right? And from there, right, we can come down and we can see, well, it's not loading, but it's telling me that I'm in Sydney. So if I had some resource that I really needed to view as if I were in Australia, this would solve my problem. Same thing with my father-in-law. When he's in Ecuador, he can log in as if he's in California and check his internet there and check his email. So it's something, especially for international students and whatever, if you want to be able to be as if you're in your home country, this is a way of doing it. And so these are the kinds of things in college classes that people never really tell you about. 
And so I would rather be here telling you about this stuff so you're aware. Okay? So that's how it works. Uh, I'm going to switch back and we'll keep talking. And like I said, I'm going a little long today, but you guys can bear with me, right? Passwords. So this is a big one. I'm back to my doom and gloom. Sorry. This is a little bit out of date. It's a couple years out of date. Um, there's at least 1.2 billion passwords that are in the clear. You hear, you hear this stuff happen. Oh, Target got hacked. Uh, LinkedIn got hacked. Whatever. And you should change your passwords. Well, the problem with this isn't so much that they're going to log into your LinkedIn account and like manipulate your information and change what your job was. The problem with this is that people tend to use the same passwords for lots of sites. Okay? So the average internet user has at least 27 accounts online and only six and a half passwords for those 27 accounts. So they're reusing passwords. Most normal passwords can be cracked in about 90 seconds using computer. Kind of crazy, right? One in 10 passwords is a name and a year. Anybody fall into this category? I'm not asking you what the password is, right? Oh, nobody's admitting to it. Two in a thousand passwords is the word password. Love is the most common verb in a password, 12 times more common than the word hate. And guess what? If you're going to describe, use an adjective in your password, you're most likely going to use sexy, hot, or pink. Kind of silly. Question in the back. No? OK. Faster computers lead to faster password cracking. So when we're talking about password cracking, there are some safeguards that are in place. So it's not like somebody's just going to randomly start hitting your bank account and try to crack into your bank account. Uh, your bank account's going to lock them out before that happens. But we're talking about the ability of a computer to actually process and figure out what a password is. Okay. So an example here, this is using a specific uh, graphics card. It can try 8.2 billion password combinations each second. So that's a lot of password combinations that it can try. Uh, the more passwords that are leaked and discovered, the smarter the cracking software becomes. So if, for example, David, I'm going to pick on you again. Okay? Let's say that I wanted to hack into your computer. Not that I have any clue how to do that, but let's say I did. Okay? I could start by using the alphabet, A, 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 A. Let's say it was a six character password, right? A, 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 right? A, B, 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 B. Okay, that would take me forever, right? If I had one of these computers, that would go a little faster. That would, that would help. But in all honesty, what I would do first is I would go to the leaked list of passwords, all the known passwords, those 1.2 billion passwords that people have used before, and I'd try all those first. Because chances are, your password's one of those passwords. That's a whole lot faster than randomly trying the passwords. So that's how hackers and, and people that try to crack into accounts do it. They go with the known passwords. So does it really matter that LinkedIn got hacked and your password got stolen because somebody's going to lo log into your LinkedIn account? No. But that's now a known password. And so if you use that password again somewhere else, now you're starting to be vulnerable. So it's worth being aware of. So these leaks are problematic. There's an example of one of the hardcore cracking computers. It's a $12,000 computer designed to do this. There are conferences where people just work on this kind of stuff. Other things that people do that are notorious for happening. Uh, I like this one. Mustache and then spelled backwards. I don't think I can spell mustache correctly forward, let alone backward. But it is a known thing that people flip words. Number substitutions. Super thinkers. Put the three in there. right? These are known things, so they're going to try that, that variant. Uh, adding exclamation marks at the end or whatever. Those are all known things, not good strategies. So what should we do? Well, you shouldn't use the same password twice. So every account that you have online should have a different password. And you're saying, uh-oh, this is starting to get complicated. Don't worry, I'm going to show you how to do it. You should use a password that contains numbers, letters, and symbols if you can. Some websites don't. It's really annoying when they don't. You should be able to use all kinds of random characters. That's good. The more random the password, the better. If it's completely ridiculously random, like you pounded on the keyboard, that's a good thing. OK? 
Okay? Because it's completely random. So how do you do this? Well, obviously you can't remember random character passwords. Like it's just too much. Truth be told, my DVC account is a 25 character, 26 character random string of numbers and letters and symbols. I've typed it so many times that I actually have it memorized. Ridiculous. It does happen if you type it <laughs> enough times. But you can instead use a password manager. And uh, some of them are built into your phones and your browsers. Uh, Apple actually has made some great improvements to their um, keychain in terms of how that works. Uh, but there's some aftermarket ones as well. 1Password is the one that I personally use. I've used it for a long time. Uh, any of these is fine and will do its job really, really nicely. And essentially what they do is they keep track of your account and your password. They'll also generate your password in a random string of numbers. So it's really easy to get a 24 character random string of numbers, letters, and symbols and fill it in. And when you go to a website, especially on phones and, and computers that have thumbprints and whatever, it's as simple as looking at your phone and it unlocks for you. So you can have a 24 character random password and have no idea what it is, and that's okay. Most of these programs do require you to have a uh, master password, one that you memorize. I would encourage that to be a random string of password. You just have to memorize it. Um, you can memorize a few. You're just not going to memorize them all. Um, so you want to be able to generate those complex random passwords, and you want to use a separate password for every account. So for me personally, I have more than 300 accounts online. I don't know how I have that many, but because of the password manager, I know I have 300 accounts. Actually, it's closer to 400. Uh, every single one of them has a different password in it. And they're all as long as I can make them. Some, some websites trunk how many characters you can have. Uh, I try to have at least 24 random characters. That way I know I'm nice and secure. Um, and I don't have to memorize them all myself. Uh, ideally, you want to sync across your devices. There's nothing worse than sitting down at the lab computer and having to type in the random password. That's why I've memorized it here, because I don't have my password management on the school computer. So they're a little annoying for some of the accounts. Do I do it for every single one of my accounts? No. Do I have a standard password that I use for stuff that I really don't care about? Yeah, because I don't really care if that person, it's like, you know, a year and a name. <laughs> I fall under that category. Um, if it doesn't really matter, then that's fine. But for your bank accounts, 24 random characters, absolutely. So think about it. Um, the other thing is two-factor authentication. Your banks do this all the time, where they say, ah, we don't recognize your device. We have to, device, we have to text you. You guys have done this, right? You know, uh, oh, you want to log into your Gmail account. Oh, but we don't recognize your computer. Let me send you the special code. That's two-factor authentication. It's another way of making sure you are who you are. Chances are, if you're you, you have your phone with you, and you can get that notification. That's obviously even more secure than a random string of passwords, because if somebody was trying to get into your account and they didn't have your phone, they're not going to get in. Identity theft. Anybody had their identity stolen? One, two, three. Yeah, so I'm really meticulous about this stuff. I tell you about my 24 random character passwords, like this is important. I forgot something. It wasn't online. Nobody stole my identity online. This is my mailbox. So I got a call. This was like two years ago. I got a call. Hey, so uh, great news. We just approved your $25,000 loan uh, from Discover Cards, we just want to make sure that we verify a few things. Uh, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're all good. We're all good. Can you just, you know, verify a couple things? Uh, no, I didn't apply for that. Call up my bank. Oh, yeah, you know, we got a notice that you applied for a credit card, too. Uh, okay. Uh, start, start doing credit check, background checks, and whatever. Turns out I opened Comcast accounts in Houston, Texas. Uh, I bought eight different cell phones scattered across the United States. I've even bought protection plans on those cell phones. I'm, I'm real good. I had a $25,000 loan taken out. Right? All this stuff happens because you're not securing things like your mailbox. Okay? Nine million Americans have their identity stolen each year. Uh, the estimate is 15 billion was stolen from consumers in 2015. It can happen to you. So be aware of that kind of stuff. Get yourself a locking mailbox. Okay? Use strong passwords to secure your digital world. Lock your mailbox so that people can't take stuff out of your mailbox. That's how they did it for me. They took stuff out of my mailbox. 
How they actually got all of my information, I have no idea. The interesting thing is, I, obviously, I filed police reports and all that kind of stuff. So T-Mobile in LA that, that, um, that issued several of the cell phones, um, they claimed that the person who came in that had all my information had a valid driver's license with my stuff on it. I don't know how they did that. But it can happen, so be aware. Okay? The way to check it, if you've never done this before, I would encourage you to do this and keep tracks on it. I know a lot of you are young in this, in this world, so you're not too worried about this just yet. It will happen as you get older, but it wouldn't hurt to try it now. Creditkarma.com is a website that does this for free. You can check your credit score and you can find out whether you have any hard inquiries on your credit. That's when people are actually applying for real stuff. And if it's not you, you should be aware. Okay? So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Branding yourself. Okay, everybody, I know you're all like half asleep by now, right? Because I just drone on and on and on. All of you have your computers up. Pull up Google, and I want you to do something for me. Vanity search time. Type in your name. How many people found their, themselves on the first hit? No? Okay. The more unique, unique your name is, the more likely it is you are to find yourself. So it turns out that I actually died in a suntan bed, if you Google me. I, I don't know. I'm here as a ghost, I guess. The point, though, and I like you guys all to do this because it's kind of entertaining. If you add other words, like if I said Grant Adams and architecture, I would find myself. But the point here is that if you don't actively cultivate who you are online and the stuff that belongs to you, Google or Yahoo or uh, Microsoft or whoever is going to determine who you are. And I can tell you right now that when you go to apply for a job, the first thing that your, employ your prospective employer is going to do is to Google you and to look you up on Facebook because they want to know about you. So those are the first two things that you're going to do. So if you pay attention to this, you can control in a kind of circuitous way what they see about you. And that's what we're going to talk about. And that's what you're going to work on today. So how do we do this? We need to establish your online identity. So you could, of course, buy your own website and run your own website, but you could do something a little bit simpler than even that. If you want to do that, it costs about $12 a year, um, and you have complete control over what it is. Um, I'm going to skip through this stuff because I've already talked way too long. Um, if, you want to, if you want to go back and look at the slides, that's fine. This is about how you choose domain names uh, and registrars, etc. And I'm going to stop here on a personal landing page. This is what I'm going to encourage you guys to do today. What this is, is it's a single page. There are companies that do this for you. We're going to use a, um, a, a company today that does this for free. It's a web page that says, this is who I am. This is the stuff that belongs to me. This is the stuff I create. Very simple, one page. But it starts to tie you to those things that you do. So you are what you represent lets you claim those projects. Pixel Hub is the one that we're going to use. Uh, there was a great one uh, company that went out of business, so we don't get to use that one anymore. Pixel Hub's pretty good. Uh, basically, you get an image, you get your name, and you get links to other stuff that you did. So you can link to the digital tool site, for example. You can link to your LinkedIn account. You can link to your Twitter feed, or whatever it is that you want to link to. Uh, and that's a way of starting to say, this is who I am, this is my stuff. This is what I'm controlling you as a prospective employer from seeing. Uh, the more you want Google to associate your name with your stuff, the more this link starts to happen. So the way Google works, when it crawls web pages, it looks for who you are and links that are associated with you. Proximity. So every time you post, if you have the link about yourself to your personal landing page on the digital tool site, Google will start to associate the two together your name and your personal landing page and all of the things that are related to that and it will build its database. So we're going to include your personal landing page and or your LinkedIn page on your profile on the digital tool site which will help tie those things together 
on every subsequent post that you make on the digital tool site. And I'll show you how to do that. So a couple things. I told you already that prospective employers are going to look for you on Google. They're also going to look for you on Facebook. So you, as a responsible Facebook user, I, I'm happy that Facebook is on the decline from you. How many people even care about that anymore? Right? Most of you don't. That's good. Okay? But if you uh, post a bunch of pictures of you at a party where you were really drunk, for example, guess what? When your employer looks at that, that's what they're going to see. Furthermore, when you post that stuff on Facebook, the user policy says that Facebook technically owns that stuff, and they can do what they want with it. So be aware of this stuff, because it does happen. Okay? Most of you moved over to Instagram, which is kind of a subsidiary of Facebook, and you're doing Snapchat and, and whatever at this point. So I get that trends change. But when you post stuff online, be aware that it can come back to bite you when it comes to employment later on. So think about what you're posting. If you have your own um, domain name, you can actually create your own email. So like grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. It's a nice professional email. If you don't have that, that's OK. Think about your name at gmail.com or your name at yahoo.com or whatever, uh, because that'll, that'll certainly help you out a little bit. Uh, this is about setting that up. We can skip through that right now. And the best thing is to become a content creator. The more you create online, the more you post, the better your search results are going to be. Um, the one other thing that I'm going to stop with here and we're going um, to we're going to do today, uh, I'm not big on social media. I'm not big on these kinds of things because they can be kind of spammy. Um, and you can get into this ecosystem and everybody wants to be friends and all that. Yeah, I, I don't like that that much. However, uh, we're at a place where it's pretty much standard practice for you guys that are going into the employment world eventually to have a LinkedIn page. They found their way into being kind of the gold standard of this, for better or for worse. So I'm going to ask you today to work on a resume and post it on LinkedIn. If you don't already have a LinkedIn account, you're going to create one today. If you do have one, then you're going to update your LinkedIn account. If you absolutely violently disagree with having a LinkedIn account, I get it. Guess what? You can do a real resume on Word and turn that in instead. That's OK with me. Okay? But the point is to think about who you are and the kinds of things that you've done and start to organize your thoughts. Because you as a student are starting to have value. And when you think about getting a job, you're going to need a resume. You're going to need this kind of information. So we're going to take some time today and actually get that together um, and go from there. So I'm going to stop now. Like I said, I went a little long. I apologize. We'll take a 12, it's 9.18. We'll take a 12-minute break. And we'll come back at 9.30. And I'll walk you through everything that we're going to do in exercise 102. OK? OK, so we're going to start back up again uh, with exercise 102. And I'm going to walk you through a couple different uh, things. We're going to start with part one. Uh, some of these I'm going to let you guys work. You don't need too much from me. But I want to talk specifically about backing up your work in part one, the calendars in part two, um, and then we can go from there. You guys can spend some time uh, on the rest of it. But first off, when it comes to um, backing up your work on the school computers, remember that they are frozen. So every time you turn them on, this process is going to have to happen if you want your work to be backed up. Um, I apologize for that, but it's kind of just the way things are going to work. Um, so, and, and this is actually something that I do every time I sit down at this computer. So first thing I do is I plug in my hard drive or my flash drive into the ports on the front of your machine. I would pay attention to which port you actually plug it into and try to plug it into the same one every time. So for me personally, I plug it into the far right of the four USBs um, that hopefully doesn't matter so much for this class, but when you move on to 136, we'll keep your drive letter consistent every time you sit down at the computer, which is good for V-Ray and your materials. So it doesn't really matter for this class, but I'd rather kind of train you in that early on, um, assuming that you're going to move on and do 136 with me. So I've gone ahead and I've uh, plugged in my hard drive, and so it's on the computer. I'm going to come down to the taskbar on the lower right side by the clock. I'll click the up-facing arrow. And when I do that, there's a little grayed out cloud icon. And if you hover over it, it'll say OneDrive not signed in. So I'll go ahead and I'll click on that. 
OneDrive not signed in. And it's going to pop up this OneDrive isn't connected. Sign in to OneDrive to get started. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to click on the Sign In button here. And it's going to say Set Up OneDrive. This, by the way, if you get a little bit lost, if you go to the Tutorials Digital Life 0.2, it will walk you through exactly what I'm doing. Um, so you can go back and, and go through that if you need to go back and, and double check it. You're going to enter your email address here. I would recommend using your school email address because you get 25 gigs for free. If you have a separate OneDrive account that you would like to use that has more space on it, that's fine with me. Uh, but I just find OneDrive to work pretty well when it comes to backing stuff up. So I'm going to go ahead and enter my school email address. My email is different than yours. Yours is you know, first initial, last name, your last three of your uh, student ID at, uh, what is it, insight.dvc.edu or something like that. Uh, mine's different because it's faculty, so don't follow what I type. <laughs> it's, it's yours. It's your insight email. Uh, mine is, uh, Uh, is gadams407 at email.4cd.edu. It's different. Okay? Um, so I will then click on Sign In. When I do that, it brings up this page asking me whether this is a personal account or a work or school account. Yours, if you're using your Insight, will be a work or school account. Mine is also a work or school account. So I will click on that work or school button. And it will then ask me to type in my password. So this is your Insight password. The one that you use to log in to like register for classes and stuff. So you need to type that in. And it will sign in. Now, when I get to this page here where it asks, this is your OneDrive folder. I don't want the OneDrive folder to be on the computer. I want to point it to my flash drive. So I'm going to click the Change Location button right here to do this. If you skip past this step, you can't go back to this step. You have to disconnect and then reconnect. So it's a little annoying. That's the way Microsoft has it set up. So when I choose my location, I'm actually going to pick my external drive. It's right here, the D drive. Uh, by the way, I've named my hard drive my name. So if somebody were to find it and plug it in, it would be fairly obvious who it belonged to. Might be something you want to do. Maybe not. Uh, be aware. The other thing you could do is get one of those label makers and, and put it on the flash drive. By the way, we're only two days into the semester, and I have two flash drives sitting up here that people have left behind so far. So this is a very common thing. Right? If, by the way, I find a flash drive left behind, it will either be right here on the computer desk or I'll put it on the tray right here, one or the other. That's where I tend to put them. OK, so I've picked my, the root of my drive right here. And I'm going to go ahead and click on Select Folder. Now, I already have my OneDrive folder because I sync every time I plug in. So it's going to ask me, it's going to say, wait a minute, this folder and a bunch of files already exist in this folder. Do you want to choose a new location or use this location? No, I do want to use this location because this is my OneDrive folder. So I'm going to say use this location. And then I'll go ahead and click on Next. So I've set it up so that it's on my flash drive. And when I click Next and I click Next, it's going to say, do you want to sync everything? Yes, I want to sync everything. And we get through these. And when I get to the end, I'll click Open my OneDrive folder. And when that happens, we'll see that my OneDrive folder on my flash drive has a bunch of the little sync icons showing up. And it's going to start to sync all the content that's in that folder. So remember, for you guys, I suggested that you have your resources folder outside of your OneDrive, just so that you don't eat up quite as much space. You'll figure out how to manage your 25 gigs. Um, I think you can get through this semester uh, with just 25 gigs, um, at least in my class. So every time you sit down at the computer, you're going to have to do this. So it's not going to stick, unlike at home. Now, when you get home, remember that's the other part to get the third copy of your file on your computer at home, you'll go ahead and install OneDrive. There is a Mac version of OneDrive, so you can do it on your Mac, same as you would um, on, a, on a Windows computer. You'll connect it. You'll tell it where the folder is going to go. And that will then save all the information when you're working here back to your home computer. So it's a way of backing up your stuff. So the only part of this whole equation that relies on you 
is that when you sit down at the computer, you have to actually sign in to OneDrive each time. Um, that's the unfortunate consequence of having the computers locked. When you go to eject your flash drive, right now, if I were to come down and eject my flash drive, like this, it would say, nope, I can't do it because OneDrive is syncing. So if you find that you really need to go and it hasn't finished syncing or, or whatever and you need to unplug your flash drive, you have two options. One, shut down the computer and pull the drive. Second option would be to disconnect or sign off of your OneDrive. So if I were to click on OneDrive here, you can go to More and you can say Close OneDrive. And as soon as you say Close OneDrive, you would have to set it back up again, obviously. Uh, but that would let you eject your flash drive. So if you want your flash drive out, those are the two ways of getting to it. Beyond that, essentially it will sync all the files that you're working on in the background, which is the idea behind this. If you're working on a particularly big file, so let's say we're working on a Photoshop file, that Photoshop file balloons up and it's a gig in size. I hope it doesn't, but let's say it does. Uh, it may take a while to finish that sync to have your final version. So if you finish right at the end of class, it probably hasn't synced yet. So just be aware that it may take a little bit of time to get caught up uh, later on. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So I'd like you guys to try to do that today and so that you feel comfortable in, in how that, that process works. And then please get in the habit of every time when you sit down at the computer, going ahead and setting that up because it's going to save you uh, with that backup. So when you turn and break your flash drive off or you leave your flash drive behind and you can't find it, you still have all your stuff. That's the important thing here. So that's part one. There's nothing for me to really turn check off that you did it. It's just something that I'm asking you to do um, during the course of today. The second part is subscribing to the calendar feed for this class. I'm going to do it using a Google Calendar, uh, using a, a Gmail account that's not my primary Gmail account, because obviously I wrote the calendar and it's in the Gmail account, so I have to use a different account to do it. Um, and I'm going to walk through how to subscribe to it. The process is very similar if you're doing it in Outlook or Yahoo or pretty much any other calendar. Um, if you're struggling with how to do it in, in a different calendar, I can help you through it. But it is, it is very much the same. Uh, you're just looking for the same kinds of things. So a couple things about that. First off, when we go to do this, we're going to need our calendar feeds in the first place. So I'm going to go to Digital Life 0 0.5. Let me just make sure. Um, and this is going to give us our calendar feeds. It's also going to walk through a variety of step-by-steps depending on which software you're using and where you want to bring it in. So I'm going to be working on Google Calendar. I have my Google Calendar open here. I have nothing subscribed currently to it. Uh, but I've gone ahead and I've logged into my account. Once it's logged in, I need to add this calendar. So over here on the left side below the main calendar, the month calendar, there is an add calendar button. And next to it there are three stacked little, little dots. I'm going to click on those three stacked little dots and I'm going to add a calendar from URL. That's the one I want to pick. And when I do that it's going to ask me for the URL of the calendar. Well I need to know what that URL is. So I'm going to go back to my calendar feeds tutorial here and I have written out what the, you guys are in the morning, this is the calendar feed here. So I will take that really long, nasty little link and I'm going to copy it. Be careful, sometimes you get an extra space in the front when you go to copy it. Sometimes you get an extra space at the end. That will mess things up. So make sure you don't have any of those extra spaces. I'll right click and I'll copy. That gives me that link. I'll jump over into my Google Calendar. I will right click again and I will say paste. And there's that really long, nasty link. I'll make sure that there isn't a space at the front because sometimes that happens. And I'll go ahead and click on the Add Calendar button. It'll say Calendar Added and then it will show up under the Settings for Other Calendars. There it is. So I'm going to go back to my calendar itself and lo and behold, oops, here we are. We're in the middle of our lab portion and it now comes straight into your calendar. If I were to jump forward by a week, We'd see what's happening next week. And you can keep going forward. There's when I hand out, or when, when you guys have your first assignment due, for example, that shows up there. So all that stuff is always going to be on the calendar, and I'm going to update it. 
don't worry about the first assignment. You'll get that. OK? So that's how you would subscribe on a Google Calendar. If you're using one of the other calendars, instead of looking at Google, you would look. This is the, the iCal in your Mac calendar. If you were using Outlook, you could follow the Outlook calendar. Essentially, you're looking to subscribe to a calendar by URL. That's all you need. And then you'll copy it, uh, the address, which is right there. So that's how you would subscribe to a calendar. I'm going to ask that you all do that. I would like to verify that you've all done this. So once you have it, leave the tab open so that I can see it. And I will walk by and, and check you guys off to make sure you've all done that uh, and have that in. So it's really important that you have the calendar. And I want to make sure that that is something that you get accomplished today. So that's part two. Part three, I suggest it's optional. But I suggest you spend time forwarding your email accounts into one primary account. Um, but again, that's optional. You can do it or not do it. I won't check on it. Okay. Next thing under part four is your LinkedIn account, working on your resume. Again, if you don't want your, uh, you, if you don't want to have a LinkedIn account and you want to do a, a traditional resume like in Word and write what you did, that's okay too. Um, you're going to spend a good 30 minutes probably working on that portion of it. And then if we flip it over, we're on to part five, which is the Pixel Hub. Dot me. So this is my pixelhub.me. And it pulls in content that I've created, lectures that I've posted, um, et cetera. It also has links to uh, my Twitter feed, my LinkedIn account, my YouTube videos, et cetera. So when you go to set this up, we're doing a free one. You don't need to pay for any of the premium stuff. You can click on Get Your Free Pixel Hub page. You'll sign up. Once you've signed up, you'll be able to log in. And this is where you can actually change content. So um, in each of these categories, you can, you can basically edit. So there's my picture. I can work on editing it if I wanted to. If I, if I wanted to change, where's the, there's the background image. Yeah, here's, here's my name. I could change that, um, et cetera. When we get down into the link section, Right? I could edit the links. There it is. There's the ones that I'm seeing. If I wanted to add another link, for example, if I wanted to add my digital tools content to this, um, I would add by URL. I have written here how you would find just your content on the digital tools site. Uh, it is digitaltoolsforarchitects.com slash author and then your username. So for me, this was grant.adams, for example. And that's going to show just stuff that I've posted. Those are things that I've posted. And so I can take that link. I can copy it. I can go back to my Pixel Hub page. And I can add that link and say, OK. Um, uh, and then I could save link. And that's going to show up right there. So there's my link to the digital tools content, for example. So it's pretty easy to set up. It's pretty easy to have your stuff automatically kind of flow in here. If you want to make adjustments, you want to change background images, et cetera, it's really just a simple personal landing page. Once I'm done with this, I'm going to take the address. So in my case, it's pixelhub.me slash Grant Adams. I'm going to copy that address. And I'm going to go back to the Digital Tools site and go to my dashboard. And I'm going to come down to my profile. And under my profile, as I scroll down here, I'm going to change my website. I actually have my own personal landing page. That's what this is. Uh, but I would put my Pixel Hub page right there as my website. That then will, whenever I make a post, It will cause a link to my home page to be posted right next to whatever it is that I posted, which helps your Google association. So it, it cross-references that to this. Uh, right now, it's set to, to my actual own personal uh, home page, which is right here. And I, I decided to write my own because I own the website domain. But you guys get the idea. Okay, It's the same concept. I still have my content here. It's a personal landing page. 
Uh, OK, so you guys are going to work through your Pixel Hub. When you're done, I would like you to make a post today uh, by taking a screenshot of your Pixel Hub page. So here's my Pixel Hub page. I want to take a screenshot of this. We can use something called the snipping tool. If you use the little Windows search here, you can start typing snipping, snipping tool. There it is. We're going to create a new snip. And you basically can draw a box on the screen and take a screenshot of your Pixel Hub page. There it is. Once I'm done, I can save it. And I'll save it on my flash drive. And for me, I have my uh, live demonstrations. There's my 135 exercises. And here's exercise 102. And we will call this um, personal landing page. And I'll go ahead and save. And so there's my personal landing page. Um, that screenshot then will be my featured image when I create my post. So I'll go up on the digital tool site, go to new, and then post. And this would be exercise 102. I'll scroll all the way down on the right side and click on Set Featured Image. I will upload that file that I just saved. Of course, I didn't pay attention to where I saved it. That was a problem. I saved it. I just don't know where. Oh, I saved it. Yeah, you're right. I saved it in the correct folder. Even better. We go to my OneDrive. There it is. And I'll click Open. That will then be my featured image for this post. And once it's done, I'll go ahead and click on Set Featured Image. And it will show up in the lower right corner here. There it is. I'll scroll back up, and I'm going to use my Categories section to say that this is Digital Tools for Designers, and this is Exercise 102. Once I have those set, I'll scroll back to the very top, and I'll click Publish. Let me add. There. And I'll go ahead and click Publish. That's my post um, that I've done under Part 5. Um, so the last thing I do mention under Part uh, I mention it under Part 6, Step 9. Uh, and that is that if you want on the Digital Tools site to have your, when you post something, Oops, I should have viewed the post. If you want to have your picture show up there, uh, it's because this is a WordPress site, it's done through something called Gravatar, which is a WordPress thing uh, that essentially associates an image with your email address. So if you want to, I have instructions on how it's Digital Life 0.13. Uh, and it'll walk you through how to actually set up so that your picture drops in naturally there um, using the Gravatar system. I apologize that there's not a way to just do it directly on the website, but since it's WordPress, that's kind of how they deal with pictures. Uh, that is optional. If you want to have just the blank person there, that's fine. Some people like to have their pictures there. Sometimes it helps your association, or when people are commenting, they know who they're commenting, uh, who the various people are. So it is something that's optional if you want to, to work through that as well. So I'm going to give you the rest of the time today to, to kind of work through this stuff. Remember, I'm, I want to check you all off for your calendars. So I will walk around. And while I'm behind you, just make sure you have the calendar. You can pop it up. I can see that you have those things input into your calendar, and you're, you're getting the digital tool stuff. And uh, then I'm happy. Are there any questions? No? For those of you that are on the wait list still hoping to get in, um, I think I have one seat so far. Uh, but I'm going to go back through the roll and, and double check and see where everybody is, see if anybody dropped and whatever. So hang tight while I check on that. Um, and we'll go from there. <laughs>